Man, I feel the presence and power of God right now. How many people are feeling the presence of God, the power of God, the holiness of God, the goodness of God? We don't have to pray. We get to pray. And the great news is, is that all these prayers are not us begging God as that we want revival more than him. This is us just aligning our heart with his. Us stirring our heart into the reality of who we really are. That we would long, that we would sing the song of the ages from the church. Come, Lord Jesus, come, come. See, he is eternal life. First John, turn your Bibles to First John right now. We're going we're to read something real quick. Anybody like the Jesus School of Evangelism? Anybody want to go to the Jesus Conference? Go to the Jesus School? You know, in Acts chapter uh, 10, I believe it is, um, the Apostle Peter said that Jesus taught us to preach. He commanded us to preach. And, and right after that, he begins to preach to Cornelius and his whole household. And that's the Jesus School of Evangelism right there in the book of Acts. Anybody want to preach what Jesus told the apostles to preach? He tells us what he, what he preached in Acts chapter 10. And in 1 John 4, John's going to give us another glimpse into what they were commissioned to preach and what they were preaching. For if we're going to have their original results, we've got to preach the original gospel. How many people know the power is in the gospel? Romans 1, I shall not be ashamed. Say, I shall not be ashamed, not be ashamed. Of, the of the gospel. For it is the power, it is the power. of God. Unto salvation for all who believe. Come on, we shall not be ashamed of the gospel. Verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. He's talking about Jesus Christ. This is a firsthand account, an eyewitness account. I've seen eternal life. I've seen the word of God made flesh. I handled him. I touched him. I put my fingers in the holes of his hands and in his sides. I watched him be crucified. I watched him resurrect from the dead. This is why they're writing the gospels, that we would have faith that he is the son of God. He really did resurrect from the dead, and he's alive, making intercession for you 24-7 at the right hand of the Father. Think about that right now. The Holy Spirit is interceding for you right now. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, the Holy Spirit's interceding for you. Jesus is interceding for you right now. Two-thirds of the Godhead are interceding for you right now as we're speaking. I want to let you know it's going to be okay. We win. And we're winning. Verse 2, the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That's which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy, say joy, may be full. He writes you these things so that your joy would be full. Now listen, if we believe the word of God, it will manifest in fullness of joy. How do you measure fullness? Overflow. A glass isn't completely full unless it's splashing on the floor. And you're not completely Full of joy unless you're splashing on the person to your left and to your right. The more aware you are of the presence of God with you, the more it will manifest in your countenance. Look at your neighbor and say you look better with a smile on your face. We can tell how much you believe the word of God by what comes out of your mouth. 
Is it words of life that produce life and joy? Or does it tear down and bring depression and sadness and unbelief? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Come on, how aware of you are you of his presence with you right now? I am with you always. He's here with us now, with us now. I tell you all this, that your joy may be full. Fellowship with him and with one another. Look at your neighbor. I want you to see Christ in your neighbor. I want you to know they're full of Christ. Look at your own hands right now. Just look at your hands. Everybody put your hands in front of you right now. Just put them in. Look at them. Say, these hands are full of Jesus. Think about it for a minute. Turn them over. When I lay these hands on the sick, Jesus lays his hands on the sick. Because I'm one with him. See, Jesus prayed for you in John 17. How many people think that Jesus gets what he prays for? He prayed not only for the disciples, but for those who would believe in him because of the testimony of the disciples, of which we believe because of the testimony of which we're reading tonight. So he prayed for you that you would be one in him and he would be one in you. That the glory which was given to him before the foundations of the earth, he's now given you that glory. See, you can't steal glory that's already been given to you. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but the point is that you were created for glory. And Jesus has given you the glory. How can you steal glory that he gave to you? When you lay your hands on the sick, he lays his hands on the sick. You're full of the presence of Jesus Christ, of his Holy Spirit. Verse 5. This is the message which we have heard from him. From who? Say Jesus. This is the Jesus school of evangelism right here, 1 John. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you. That God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, We have fellowship with one another and the blood, say the blood. Blood. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Put your hand on your heart. Say the blood Blood. cleanses me me. of of all sin. He doesn't remember it anymore. So I won't either. The accuser comes day and night and he just accuses you of who you're not. But the Savior tells you who you are. You're a child of God. The spirit of adoption says, you're my child. I choose you. I choose you. I choose you. While you're yet still a sinner, he died for you. He chose you. He chooses you. He chose you before the foundations of the earth. He appointed you. He created you for works prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. You just have to believe. Say, I believe. This is the gospel. This is the good news. The gospel has the power to save your soul. The gospel has the power to bring deliverance, to bring wholeness to you, to bring healing to you. This good news, once we understand what Jesus has accomplished on the cross, it changes everything. 
Turn in your Bibles to Psalm 139. Verse 14, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Man, I can just drink that in all night right there. <laughs> he knit you in your mother's womb. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully raw in the slowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they... All were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts towards me, God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in numbers than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you in another place. His thoughts for you are more than the stars that are in the heavens. In other words, God is crazy about you. He can't quit thinking about you. That's how many thoughts he has towards you. He's absolutely enamored with you. He, in Song of Songs writes it this way. Just one glance of your eye and he has to look away. He's overcome. This is God who knows everything. Who knows every star that's in the heaven. He knows every hair that's on your head. Which for William is not very much. <laughs> Don't stick no bear on me. What a man of God. I'm just saying, God is so awesome, and yet he can't quit thinking about it. He has that many thoughts for you. It's amazing once we understand that he created us and that he loves us. It's a simple truth, but I want you to understand that Jesus loves you. He loves you. When you believe that and you say that to somebody, it will change them. There's more power when you say Jesus loves you and you believe it here than if you just say Jesus loves you and you only think it here. Jesus loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He loves you. He loves you. And he's God. And if he's for you, who can be against you? I'm just saying there's no reason to be shaken off of your joy. To be shaken out of peace. He is the rock of that is your peace. He is your source of joy. Your joy is not circumstantial like those who are in the world. It's not circumstantial based on the situations in the world. Who gets elected in the office? Who gets impeached and who doesn't get impeached? It's not circumstantial based on the economy. It's not circumstantial based on any virus in the earth. It's not circumstantial. Your joy is in the person of Jesus Christ and his word which says I will be with you always even to the end of the age forever and ever you have been reconciled to the father that's good news this verse means a lot to me you know um, I lived in Redding California for a while and um, my plan was, we, my wife and I were going to live in Reading. Bill Johnson was my pastor, and Chris Valentin was the assistant pastor. And I got to listen to Bethel music every Sunday and, and Friday and all the conferences. And, I mean, it was just heaven on earth all the time. I mean, I loved it. And I thought, man, we'll buy a house here, and we'll go to the nations from here, and we'll always come back and forth. And that was a good plan. I mean, it's warm there. It's hot there. Sometimes it's the hottest place on planet earth. I like warm weather. Matter of fact, when I got saved... And uh, the Lord called me to be a missionary. I said, I'll go anywhere in the world for you except for Russia. And I'll even go there if you want me to. I like nothing against Russian people or anything like that. But, you know, I like warm weather, man. God, I don't like frozen tundra. You, you didn't make me that way. I like the warm weather. Please send me somewhere warm. And I say, God has a sense of humor. Because I forgot to say Canada. And I fell in love with this beautiful blue-eyed girl from Canada. You see, it was funny. When I got saved, I thought I was supposed to be the Apostle Paul and never get married because he wrote it. You know, it's better not to get married and just preach the gospel and stuff. And I'm like, man, I guess, I mean, I'm a zealot, man. I'm a black and white individual, man. I love to be passionate, all or nothing. And so I thought, okay, I guess I'm not getting married. I'm going to go into the jungle. I'm going to drop me off in the rainforest, and I'm going to find every unreached people group that there is, and I'm going <laughs> to preach the gospel. And if I don't know the language, I'm going to drop down on my knees and I'm going to wait until I preach in tongues. <laughs> you know, like I just was on fire, man. I was, I was ready, you know. And um, so when I went to YWAM, I got there and I saw this girl and I thought to myself, um, I can't quit 
looking at this girl. I can't quit thinking about her when I'm not around her. And I thought, man, this is the distraction of the devil. I started rebuking it. And it only lasts about 15 to 20 minutes, and now I'd start thinking about her again. Man, I was like starting to freak out. I couldn't get free of this, uh, this uh, meditation about how beautiful this girl was and how much I liked her. And, and uh, eventually I read in the book of Genesis where it said, it's not good that man shall be alone. I'll make a helper comparable. And I thought, I'm going to listen to the father and not Paul here. <laughs> anyway, we ended up started dating, which is a funny story in and of itself. And, and um, we got married. We moved to Reading. And, and my wife is a planner. And she thought, you know, I'm going to wait five years, you know, to get pregnant. Let's just be together. We got married young. She was 22. I was 21. And uh, so our plan was, let's not get pregnant at first. Let's travel and do some stuff. And, and uh, we lasted two years. And uh, we weren't planning it. I guess we had something to do with it. But uh, it just wasn't in our plan. <laughs> and um, anyway, uh, we always had this thought that we'll have a boy first. I was a fighter um, before I got saved. And, um, and I thought to myself, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a boy first. Man plans his ways, but God directs his steps, you know. And I'm going to have a boy first, I thought, and I'm going to teach him how to fight. And, and that way, when we have the girl next, she won't be able to date anybody. <laughs> it's a good plan, right? And so when we got pregnant, we went to an ultrasound, and we got an ultrasound. Um, but before that, before we got the ultrasound, when we were living in Reading, right after we found out we were pregnant, I was in an uh, evangelism school. My friend Chris Overstreet used to ask me to come and help him in his evangelism schools. And uh, my job was to come, and during lunch, Chris would line me and a bunch of other guys up across the front of the conference, and he would say, uh, if you want to catch this, because some things are better caught than taught. Anybody recognize that? You can get, go through teaching, but all of a sudden, once you see it done, they say that, that we only re- retain 85% of the things we hear. I mean, that we, we, we don't, do not retain 85% of the things that we hear. Come on. That you'll only retain 15% of what you don't do. And, and the opposite is true, that you'll retain 85% of the things that you do, that you activate. And so, if you hear something over the weekend, if you receive training and equipping, which it would be a tragedy to come to a global awakening event and not receive any training. But it's not good enough just to be a hearer of the word. Figure out how you can activate and do the word immediately. So go apply it. Amen? Go teach it to somebody else. You have a Facebook or uh, social media. You can just jump right on and teach what you just learned. Watch how much more you retain when you activate it. And so anyway, we would go to these conferences, and he would say, go take Richie to lunch. And he said, Richie, just be yourself. Because if I go to lunch, then we're going to minister to the waitress and the hostess and and everybody in the parking lot, and people are going to get saved. And people see that. And so I'm just there, and I'm worshiping in this conference. And um, while I'm worshiping, it's just like a guy with an, a, a guitar, just an acoustic set, nothing special or bells and whistles or anything. And he's just worshiping, and I'm worshiping, you know, and all of a sudden, boom, I go into a trance. Not, not just the vision, like I'm in the room, I hear people in the room, but I'm in the future. I can smell honeysuckle. I can feel the cold air blowing on my face, and I'm pushing a little girl in a swing. And I see this girl jump off the swing and land on the ground, and she runs back around the swing, and I see her face. And a butterfly flies between us, and boom, I'm back in the room. And I hear the Lord say, you're going to have a little girl, name her Abigail Joy. Now, Abigail means her father's joy, and her middle name is Joy, so she's her father's Joy Joy. Or it means fountain of joy, so fountain of joy, joy. She's a double portion of joy. So every time we say her name, it's fountain of joy, joy. Her father's joy, joy. So she's going to be joyful whether she likes it or not. (laughs) Which is a core value in the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is righteousness, peace, and? So if you lack joy, you lack at least a third of the kingdom. 
That's another message for another time. I believe Global has it. You can get it in the bookstore or something like that. But I have a whole message on joy, which will change your life, honestly. And joy is powerful and can be released, just like peace can be released and displace things. It's really powerful. I've seen a lot of people healed just simply by laughing at the sickness. How cool is that? So anyway, um, I have this encounter. Now, there's three parts of prophecy, revelation, interpretation, and application. So you're hardwired to get revelation because you were knit in your mother's womb for relationship with God. And you can't have a relationship with anyone that you can't communicate with. So some of you have to repent from believing the lie that you can't hear God's voice, that you can't prophesy that that's a gift. No, it's not. It's just your nature. Come on. Prophecy is not just a gift. Prophecy is your nature. This is what you were created to do. You were created. I pour out my spirit on all flesh that your sons and daughters shall prophesy. This is his dream for all of us, to be able to hear his voice and to tell people what we hear him saying. Amen? So you're created for revelation. You are hardwired to get revelation. That's oftentimes not the issue. The issue comes in the interpretation and the application. And everything that we hear through revelation has to pass through the lens of our, of our understanding of the nature and character of God and our theology. Come on. What we believe about God and what, do we, what we believe about his plan. So eschatology is an important lens by which we'll run a lot of our revelation through. Seriously. What you believe about the end determines what you do in the middle sometimes. Amen? Come on. So interpretation and application make a big difference. Now, here's what, I, here's what I've learned. Oftentimes, people get the application wrong in the timing. So they'll get a revelation, they'll get an interpretation, but they'll get the application wrong in the timing of things. Now, God just showed me I was going to have a little girl. He didn't tell me when I was going to have a little girl. So it doesn't mean that this baby's going to be a little girl. He didn't tell me this baby was going to be a little girl. He just said I was going to have a little girl. So I went home and I told my wife, I don't know if this baby will be a little girl, but eventually we're going to have a little girl. And when we have this little girl, we have to name her Abigail Joy. My wife freaked out. She said, I never told anybody, but I've always wanted to name my first little girl Abigail. So that was a good confirmation. So then we get our first ultrasound, and it was one of those 2D ultrasounds. Anybody ever see a 2D ultrasound? What I mean by that is those black and white ones where it just looks like black and white blobs and stuff like that. And uh, you got to, by faith, believe the doctor. (laughs) They're like, that's the arm, and that's the leg, and you're like, okay, I believe you. You know, like, and he's like, you're going to have a boy. So we're like, yeah, we're going to have a boy. That's awesome. And we're all excited, and any parents know this, that when the baby's forming in the womb, you make a connection with the baby before it's ever born. Like in your imagination, like you're dreaming about this baby, I would sing over the child every night. I remember when I first got saved, there's a girl named Catherine Oder, and she sang that song, Lord, you are more precious than silver, more costly than gold, more beautiful than diamonds, and nothing I desire compares to you. And when she began to sing that song, a cappello, out by, it was just me and her and another guy named Andrew there on the, on a abandoned beach. And we were looking up at the stars with the James River in the background. When she began to sing that, I began to feel the presence of God for the first time. I just began to weep and cry. We sang it, the same song for like an hour. And I would sing it for eternity because I just was so captivated with the presence of God. And, and from that day on, any time I would get afraid, if I was getting ready to minister and I would be intimidated, or if, if I was, at any time I just wanted to connect and tap into the presence of God, I'll sing that song, even to this day. It's my default. I go back to that moment. Anybody else have memorial songs like that, where you remember the presence of God and you sing those songs and it's like it brings you back into that encounter? Like, and so for me, I would sing that song over my little girl every night. I would lean in. In, and put my head on Chelsea's belly, and I would just sing this song because I wanted my child to grow up in the presence of the Lord. And, and what I didn't realize at the time is that there comes a time in the formation of the baby within the womb where, where they can hear the voice of their mom. They can hear the voice of their father. They can hear the voices that are consistently around them within the womb. And so every night this baby 
is hearing my voice and associating it with the presence of God in the womb. Okay, so I'm connecting with this, with this, what I think is a little boy. I've got a redskin jersey on. I don't hear nothing from no Eagles fans around here. You only got one. Until you get three, I don't want to hear it. Anyway, so I mean, I, I'm throwing the football with him. I, I know every, what he's going to look like. We're going to be best friends. I mean, I've connected with my boy, man. I know him. I feel like I know him anyway. And about seven months in, my wife gets provoked to jealousy because my sister-in-law is pregnant at the same time, and she goes and gets an ultrasound at like six, seven months, and, uh, and it's 4D. Anybody ever seen the 4D ultrasounds? I mean, when you see those, like, you can, it's in color, and you can see the whole features of the baby. Like, you can see its nose and its ears, and you're like, oh, my God, it's got my chin. Oh, my God, that's amazing. And, like, my wife saw that. And she was provoked to jealousy. She was like, I got to have one of those and you got to pay for it. <laughs> and I said, yes, ma'am. Because when your wife is pregnant, that's your answer every time. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and so we went and got another one. And in the middle of it, the ultrasound tech says to me, do you know what the sex of your baby is? And I said, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a boy. She said, hold on one minute. And she leaves, and she comes back with this contract. She says, got to sign this. And I'm like, what for? She says, uh, so I can release the sex of the baby to you. And I said, I already know what it is. It's a boy. She said, just sign the paper. <laughs> so I signed this paper, you know, and she turns around this 4D screen, and right there in the 4D is girl parts. <laughs> no doubt about it. And I got to be honest, my heart sank at first, man, like, I mean, I was excited to have a little girl. That's not the issue. I like, I raised world-changing girls, but I never had a trance where I saw a little boy. I might be like Philip and only have girls, which is fine, but my heart had already connected with this imaginary boy that I might not ever have. So I got over it real quick, and, um, and I got excited, and I was connecting with Abigail, and um, began to sing to her and talk to her in the womb, and my wife got a hold of this book. I don't know if some of you might have read it, but it's called Supernatural Pregnancy. Anybody ever heard of that? The premise of the book is that uh, pain in childbirth came with the fall, with the original sin, and that Jesus paid for the sin on the cross. Therefore, we don't have to have pain in childbirth. The curse is broken. The theology seems solid, man. I mean, we, and, and my wife got a hold of that book, and let me tell you, she, she read that book more than she read the Bible. <laughs> she carried that thing around, man. I mean, she believed it. She could quote from that book, man. And uh, we were believing for a supernatural pregnancy and childbirth experience. And, um, and then the day comes, and let me tell you, we did not have. <laughs> you ever believe for something and it not manifest the way you think it's going to manifest, man? I mean, I remember the day that her water broke. We were just watching the TV, and, you know, we were thinking it's going to be all dramatic. And we're just, like, literally watching a movie. She's laying down, her water breaks, and she's like, no pain. And we got a video of her. And she's like, we're going to the hospital. We're going to have a, child, a painless childbirth. And she's all laughing. And we got the video. 28 hours later. <laughs> you want to listen to the music to focus back? No, I want to listen to music. You did this to me. And she's pulling on me and like crazy, man. No sleep. And all like she's jerking on me and you don't have any. It's just wild, man. It's messy. The baby comes out. It's blood and everything everywhere. And, and uh, the baby comes out and the baby's like, ah! and the eyes are shut solid. And, and they bring her over to this little heating lamp bed thing and they're cleaning her off and stuff. And I make sure my wife's okay. And the baby's like, ah! hasn't opened its eyes yet. And I, and I lean in. I go over to this little bed and I lean in. And I just began to sing, Lord, you are. And the moment I began to sing, she quits crying. And she turns her head and she strains her eyes open. And now my eyes are locking with my daughter's eyes as I'm singing. And she's hearing the voice that's been singing over her since she's been in the womb. I can't accurately communicate the love that I felt in that moment. I knew without a shadow of a doubt, I'd give my life for this child. It's never done anything for me except nothing. <laughs> nothing. But I know I'll give my life for this child. 
I can't describe to you the love I felt for her in that moment. It's, and this is, this is just a drop in the bucket for the love that God has for you. Not because you've done anything, but just because he loves you, because he loves you, because he loves you, because he loves you, just because he loves you, just because he loves you, because he loves you, because he loves you, because he loves you, just because he loves you, because he loves you, because he loves you, just because he loves you. He's always loved you. He's always going to love you, and there's nothing you could do about it. You start off with an A+. plus. Even while we were yet still sinners, he gave his life for us because he loves us. Come on. This is the revelation of God in Christ Jesus. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave his life for us. Come on. This is how we have to start. We start there. Amen? So then two years comes by. My wife gets pregnant. And uh, she says the night that we got pregnant, she knew it, and she said that she heard the Lord speak to her through a dream, I believe, and he said, this will be a prophet, and he'll be a boy, and he'll be a prophet to the nations. And so she tells me the next morning, here's what I heard God say, I'm pregnant, and the Lord spoke to me, and he said that it'll be a boy, and he'll be a prophet to the nations. And I looked at her, great man of faith, and I said, I'm not going to believe it until I see it in the 4D. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to get my hopes up this time. Sure enough, a couple months goes by, we go get the ultrasound. So boy, he's born. And, and about two or three years ago, maybe four years ago, I can't remember, uh, four years ago now, I, um, I went into this encounter. I was reading my Bible one day, and it was as if, I don't know if any of you have had this, uh, this experience, but God's always speaking to us, but it's like he's speaking in part. It's like he's speaking through a cloudy glass. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter, the Bible says, but it's the glory of kings to seek it out. So oftentimes God's speaking, but he speaks in parables. He conceals truth because he wants the humble to be the powerful and not the prideful. So oftentimes he hides truth because it's in the pursuit of truth that it tests our hearts. That that revelation comes through intimacy. So it's in the secret place that we get the revelation for the marketplace. Come on. So God will speak in a mystery, and then you'll take it into your intimate relationship with him. And in the intimate relationship with him, the mystery is revealed. Get what I'm saying? Come on. And so um, this day I woke up, and it was as if God was speaking to me plainly. Like every scripture was coming alive, like he was reading it to me. Like I knew... I was cross-referencing scriptures across the Bible that I had not memorized, back and forth. And, and God was speaking to me about my past, my present, and my future, and I saw it absolutely, 100%. Like, and in that moment, I knew that the experience that I was in was fleeting, like it was not there to stay. I don't know if you've ever had a revelation of the love of God, and you're in the middle of an encounter, and in the middle of that encounter, you, um, you know something so much but you know it's fleeting and you wish that you could stay there anybody ever had that like you wish that you could just maintain that forever and ever like but you know it's fleeting in the intensity of your revelation in that time like that's how it felt to me and I want to encourage you if you ever have one of these kinds of encounters cancel everything else in your script in in your schedule and just and just write just journal as fast as you can, can, journal everything that's happening. So I canceled everything that was in my schedule. The only thing that I had left on my schedule was um, a, a house church that I couldn't get out of. And so I asked my wife, would you fill in for me? Would you go to the house church for me? And, and, and would you take the kids too? And she graciously did. Has anybody ever tried to preach at a house church with like uh, a four-year-old and a, and a two-year-old? that don't have bedtimes or like children's ministry and they're like pulling on you. I mean, it was wild, I'm sure. And uh, about two or three hours comes, uh, goes away and she comes in and I'm just right and still in my encounter. She comes through the front door. She says, I don't care if you're still in your encounter or not. Tag, you're it. <laughs> I'm gonna go have a bath and a drink and you're gonna put the kids to bed. And I'm like, yes, ma'am. You know? So I'm putting the kids to bed, you know, and I put my son to bed first. And as I'm laying him in the bed, um, I give him the bottle. And if you've ever seen like two and a half, three-year-olds, as soon as they get the milk, the bottle in their mouth, their eyes get extra heavy and they start to like, 
do this, you know. And so he's kind of doing that, and I'm praying for him. But I'm still in my encounter, so there's like some extra whack on my prayers, some extra juice on it. You know what I'm talking about? Like I'm like prophesying his destiny, and I'm praying, and I'm like, you know, because I'm still in this encounter, you know. And he's like kind of ignoring me, you know, going to sleep. And uh, all of a sudden he goes, Dad! Daddy! Why is there a fire behind you? I don't see a fire, but he sees it. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Elijah prayed for his servant, and he said, God, open his eyes that he would see that there are more with us than are against us. And after he prayed, what happened? His eyes were open, and he saw chariots of what? Come on. So I'm like, Gabe, I think that's an angel. Why don't you ask him what his name is? So he says, Fire, what's your name? <laughs> then he starts trembling. He said, he said his name is Gabriel. At that moment, I began to feel it. <laughs> Listen, I hear people saying there's an angel there, and they kind of flippantly saying there's an angel there, and there's an angel. And I'm not saying they're wrong or anything. I'm just saying, biblically speaking, when an angel shows up, people, ah, they think they're going to die. And they have to say, hey, don't be afraid. I've come with a message. You know? And uh, I felt the weight of this presence of the angel. And I, I mean, I was overcome. And, and he says, uh, the fire walking out the door, the fire walking down the hallway. And I could feel it lift, 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 you know, the, the intensity of it. And so I leave, and I, and I walk down, still kind of, in, kind of shooken up by the encounter. But I walk down to my daughter's room, and I'm going to pray for her. Now, at that point, we had capped my daughter. She was only allowed to pray for three people a night. <laughs> and the reason for that is because she would pray for hundreds if you didn't cap her. And it wasn't because she was super spiritual. It's because she didn't want to go to bed. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? And so we said, you're only allowed to pray for three people. And so I go in, and, and she says, uh, hey, Daddy, can you pray first tonight? And I said, yeah, sure, so we all pray first. And so I start praying all spiritual for, my, for our neighbors. God, I pray for our neighbors who don't know you. God, I pray that they would know you. And she says, oh, Daddy, you're so silly. Don't you know that God knows everybody? And I said, you're right, sweetheart. God does know everybody, but not everybody knows God. And all of a sudden, you could see it hit her, compassion. Her eyes filled with tears. She looked off into the distance. At this revelation that there are people in the earth that don't know the Lord. Now you got to understand something. My wife, after I told her the encounter I had, she said, the Lord told me about Abigail that she would be a mixture of anointings between Heidi Baker and Chris Overstreet fire-breathing evangelist, my father's heart. So here she is. She's locked, looking off into the distance, and she's tears are in her eyes. And then she looks over at me. She comes out of it. Now, she's in an encounter, so I don't interrupt her. I just let her have her encounter. She looks over at me after a few minutes, and she looks at me, and she says, Daddy, you know what? I'm going to tell the whole world about Jesus. My girl. She is her father's heart. Listen, I tell you that whole story because no one ever told my son, you're a prophet to the nations. Or my daughter, you're a fire-breathing evangelist. They're just being who they are. I want you to understand that God knit you in your mother's womb, that he has prepared works for you before you were born, that you should walk in them, and that by grace through faith you are saved, that you're here by divine appointment, that you are a divine design, that you are a one of a kind, that you don't need to be jealous, that you don't need to compare yourself to anybody else. If you understood how amazing you were, then you would never want to be anybody but you. And you'll never be as good at being anybody else that you are at being you. But it's Christ in you. It's his glory expressed through you. It's him in you. It's the image of his son expressed through 
you. Come on. The Bible says that we have been given the ministry of reconciliation, not counting their trespasses against them. This is Corinthians. That, that, that the Spirit of God was inside of Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against us. And we have been given the ministry of reconciliation, which is what? Not counting their trespasses against them. Come on. The ministry that God is exactly like Jesus, that the Father is God, but he is love. That love is God and God is love, but God is a spirit and he's invisible, Colossians chapter 1. But his invisible attributes are clearly seen in the person of Jesus Christ. So love, which is a spirit, put on flesh and blood and dwelt amongst us. He is the light. He's exactly what God is like. God is like Jesus. See what I'm saying? You want to know what God's like? He's like Jesus. Jesus is perfect theology. This is the good news. We get it? Come on. We have the privilege to reconcile the world to a lost father. Let me tell you a story. I'll tell you a few, a two stories and then we'll close. First of all, you've got to know something about me. I grew up in Virginia where you can throw a rock and hit three churches by accident. Churches everywhere. I got saved. I prayed a prayer when I was 11, but I didn't know what it meant to be a Christian. So between 11 and 18, I had 18 felonies. I was in and out of juvenile detention. I was violent. I was a fighter. There was one day when I was 16 years old, having been on house arrest, if I got in any more trouble, I had to go back to jail. A girl had broke my heart, and uh, this guy had gotten her high and took her virginity, and I wanted to fight this guy, and this guy was talking trash and talking talking about her behind everybody in the high school, so I know if I fight this guy, I'm going to hurt him, and then I'm going to have to go back to jail. So I went to a soccer game to try to stay out of trouble. Now, when you don't know Jesus and you're trying to stay out of trouble, trouble will find you. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And so here I am at a soccer game trying to stay out of trouble, and a rival high school pulls up. They run on the field in togas. They're dancing. They're acting like idiots, you know. And I'm not going to do anything about it, but there's a soccer player from my high school, knows I'm a partier, used to come to my keg parties, and knows I'm a fighter. He says, hey, Richie, my sister's in the crowd. Punch that dude in the face. Now, I'm not going to do it, but I did say something to him. I said, you guys should grow up or something, something like that. And they, they mocked me, and they started laughing at me, and so I took off my shirt. I walked up to the back of the truck. I said, laugh now. Now, they quit laughing, everybody but the guy in the front seat. He started laughing because his girlfriend was beside him. He wanted to be punked. So I walked up to this guy, and I, and I opened the door, and I said, laugh now. And he made a bad choice. He laughed. I knocked him out in blood and everything, and his girlfriend calls the police, and immediately I, I had this revelation. That was a bad choice. See, but I'm lost. I don't know what I don't know. I'm broken. I don't have any self-control, the fruits of the Spirit. And I end up having to go back to jail. Well, two years later, I get saved. That's a radical story. I end up going to this Baptist church. I walk in. I do my first Bible study. Afterwards, this girl and this guy go to the Waffle House with me to continue the Bible study. And while we're studying the scriptures, the girl looks up at me and she says, Hey, Richie, a couple years ago, were you at a soccer game and you punched this dude in the face? And I had this thought, man, that girl in that truck was blonde hair. This girl has blonde hair. And I thought, oh, no. And she said, oh, don't worry about it, Richie. That day I started praying for your soul. Wow. Don't quit giving up. Don't quit and give up praying for your lost son and daughter, for your friend, for your neighbor. You have no idea the power of your faithful, persistent prayer. Amen? I don't think anyone comes into the kingdom apart from prayer. And so I get radically saved, and, um, but up to that point, my parents divorced when I was two years old, and I only got to see my dad on the weekends, and my mom was codependent, so we had a rotating door of fathers in and out of my life. Um, either my mom would marry them, and then they would get a divorce, or she would get a boyfriend, and they would move in, and they would be like a father, and because I'm not their biological kids, it's hard for them to connect with me. I'm kind of like a part of the package, but really they're there for my mom until football season comes around because in Virginia, football's king. And I was really good at football. I played, I was an MVP. I was in and out of the newspapers and then I'm like their son, you know, and 
until they break up, and then I'm not their son. And so you can say what's happening, you can see what's happening in the heart of a young man who just wants a father in his life. I'm longing for the affirmation of a father. I end up getting angry. That's why I'm fighting and drinking and partying and looking for affirmation in girls. But I'm always looking for the affirmation of the father. So then what happens is uh, 18 years old, I get saved. I go to YWAM. The, but here's the crazy thing. Before I get saved, as I'm in that Baptist church, I meet this guy named Sean Downey. Now, Sean Downey, we called him the story man. He was in a local, he was in a rock band in California, and they won the battle of the bands. He was the bass guitar player. Now, in that time, it was a while ago, in the, in the 90s, I believe, if you won the battle of the bands, then you got an automatic contract to open up for Maxbox 20 which means you're an automatic rock star, you're a millionaire. He had all the girls, everything that you would think is the American dream, and yet he was depressed to the point that he wanted to commit suicide. So he gets a plan, he writes out his letter, and, and he gets on the highway, and he's gonna go as fast as he can go on the highway, and he's gonna run his car into a concrete barrier. That's the way he's gonna die. That's, that's how he's gonna commit suicide. So he gets in his car, gets on the five, and he's going as fast as he can, and all of a sudden, this red Pinto car with an old lady driving, it cuts him off. It's California. And, and this old lady in this red car has a bumper sticker on the back of her car that says, Jesus is the way, follow him. So he follows this lady all over L.A., and he's going to ask her about why she cut him off and about her bumper sticker, and she's, like, going everywhere all in now these neighborhoods. Ends up in this, like, cul-de-sac circle, one way in, one way out. She, she parks. She gets out. He gets out to ask her, and he's distracted for just one second. He looks over to his left, and there's a skateboard ramp, like a half pipe, and a bunch of kids and youth all in this yard with a guy with a microphone saying something in the microphone. And so he's distracted by that for just a second. He turns back, and the lady in the car disappeared. They're just gone. So he walks over to this microphone guy, and the guy's preaching the gospel, and he gives his life to Christ. <laughs> so as Sean Downey is sharing this story, the whole time he's sharing, my hands are just burning on fire, just tingles and fire all over my hands. And I hear the Lord say, what you once despised, I'm going to use to bring healing to the nations. Now, I've always had like dry, wrinkly old man hands. That's what I call them, old man hands. Even when I was little, I had those. And, and in elementary school, I would sit on my hands on the bus because I didn't want them to be the object of somebody's jokes. You know how it is on the bus in elementary. It's like your mama jokes and all kinds of jokes and stuff. And so I would sit on my hands. And um, so I'm hearing this, and I go up to Sean Downey, and I tell him what's happening. And he says to me, uh, come with me to to the Waffle House, and he begins to talk to me about the Holy Spirit, tell me the scriptures to read, and, and he would never pray for me because we we're going to a Baptist church. I don't think he wanted to get kicked out, and uh, so he'd just tell me to read the scriptures and pray in the secret place. So was, I'm just saved. I'm reading the scriptures in Acts 2, and, and I'm, my heart is pursuing and just desiring these experiences, but what happens to me is I, I just begin to sing a new song. One night, I'm by myself, and I begin to sing just a song of my heart. And as I'm singing this song, all of a sudden, the presence and the power of God comes over my life. I mean, it hits me. And I, I get knocked onto the floor. I'm all by myself. I'm on my back. And this weight of God's presence is on me. It felt like a million pounds resting on me. And I tried to get up, but I couldn't get up. And it's just waves of God's love coming over me. And I just would sing, and I was singing, and I, now I know it to be tongues, but then I didn't know. I never had any training other than what I sing, but I was singing another language. And I thought I was only on the ground for 20 minutes, but it turned out I was on the ground for over two hours. And when finally I was able to pull myself into my seat, tears running down my face, I heard a voice from heaven said, son, I'm proud of you. Keep going. And I was undone. I just began to weep and cry, weep and cry, just weep and cry. Because number one, he called me son. And he told me that he's proud of me. 
Now, as years later, I recognize when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist and he went under the water and when he came out, there was a voice heard from heaven saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. I didn't even realize I had a baptism in the Holy Spirit in that time. The presence and the power of God came upon me in that time. It was the Father's love, the Father's baptism. It was, you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption by whom you cry out, Abba, Father. We have been given this ministry of reconciliation. And I believe that even as William uh, has been talking about family, and I'm sharing these stories about my kids That God is going to come in tonight like a flood. That he's going to baptize us in the Father's love. Now, if I can get the worship band just to come up or somebody on the keys or something, uh, at least, just to come up and help me minister. I feel like that God wants to baptize you in the love of the Father. And that is a baptism in love, which is a baptism in fire. Because our God is an all-consuming fire. And God is love. So God is love and God is an all-consuming fire. And he's a jealous God because love is always jealous. That's why we were going after this repentance from sin. See, God's not jealous because he's insecure. Love's not jealous because it's insecure. God is jealous because love always has the highest and best for what it's pointed at. I'm jealous for my daughter and my son's my, and my daughters to have the highest and best for their life. You want to get me angry? It's if I know that something's stealing abundant life from them. It is my desire that their joy would be full. And the thing about God is, is that he is the highest and best for you. Anything less than God is less than the highest and best. So he's jealous that you would receive abundant life. And this is abundant life that you would know the Father and the Son whom he sent. See, this is eternal life, that you would know the Son. You see what I'm saying? I have come that you would have life and have it in abundance. And so the compromise and the sin is anything that falls short of abundant life. You get what I'm saying? I believe that the Father wants to go beyond just the head knowledge tonight. He wants to baptize you in love. He wants you to know how much he loves you. 